everyone, I'm Laurel Griffith, and it's so good to be with you today as we study our Sunday School lesson together. Thanks for coming and um, being a part of this study. Uh, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we're so grateful that we can gather around your word once again, and we come um, with expectant hearts, Lord. We ask you to illuminate our thinking and to transform us by your spirit as we encounter you today. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, today we are going to be looking at Acts chapter 9, which is a very familiar story to most of us. It's the story of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who would become um, known as the Apostle Paul. So Saul is his Hebrew name and Paul is his Roman name. And uh, he is referred to as Saul before this conversion and after his conversion, he is referred to in Acts uh, by Luke, who is the writer of Acts, calls him the Apostle Paul. So I may slip back and forth during this lesson, but it's the same guy. Um, when we pick up with this story, we, we need to set the stage a little bit and actually go back to Acts chapter 7. And let's see the first time um, we hear about this young man, Saul of Tarsus. So I'm going to read just one verse from Luke chapter, I mean, Acts chapter 7, which is written by Luke, Acts chapter 7. And this is verse 58. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Luke is referring to Stephen, who was the first martyr in the early church. And this is uh, recorded in Acts chapter 7. And Stephen has given this beautiful testimony of who Jesus is and what Jesus has, has done. And it enrages the mob who uh, don't want to have anything to do with this Jesus of Nazareth. And they want to wipe out the followers. And so they pick up stones and hurl them at Stephen. And actually he is uh, murdered there um, by this stoning. And the people who have perpetrated this crime have taken their coats and laid them at the feet of the man named Saul. So Saul has given a stamp of approval to this execution. And now we pick up in chapter eight with a few verses. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So Paul has mounted this great persecution. There were others, of course, that were involved in this. We know that Saul is a Pharisee. He is someone who has been intent his whole life on keeping the Jewish law. He is a great scholar. He is a brilliant uh, person. And um, he has been schooled under the finest, with the finest education. And he knows the Old Testament forwards and backwards. And in this moment, he sees this um, Christianity, these followers of Jesus, as being something to extinguish. He does not see them as a new faith, but rather he sees them as a perversion of the Judaism that he loves. And so he sees this as a threat to his faith in the one true God. And he is intent on getting rid of all of those who follow Jesus. Uh, so much so that um, Luke uses words like ravage. It, it makes him sound like he almost has this animal-like intensity about this persecution. He's going from house to house. He's pulling out people who profess to be Christians. He's hauling them off to prison. And later on, we even see where he has voted um, for their execution. So he has been a part of this persecution. But here's the interesting thing. When this, when this persecution ramps up, these new believers in Christ uh, leave the city. They flee. Uh, Luke gives us this interesting detail that's only that the apostles, the ones that are left in Jerusalem. So everybody else gets out of town. They've already lost their jobs. They're losing their property. Their lives are at risk. 
This persecution is splitting families up. It's just this most intense kind of pain um, that is permeating every part of these new Christians' lives. And so they are fleeing to get away from the physical threat, but yet they're carrying with them a lot of the ramifications of, the, of this decision to follow Jesus. And so as they go, they um, are not quite they are not quiet as they go, as they uh, as they move through the surrounding countryside, as they find new places to live and settle into new lives. They continue to talk about Jesus. They continue to speak about the good news of Jesus Christ, about his life, his death, and his resurrection. So they go preaching this good news. So the point to me in this is that what man intended for evil, God turns around and uses for good. God certainly did not send this persecution. God is not the author of anything that is evil, and God would not bring evil on his good world. But when this persecution occurs, when this um, oppression begins to ramp up, God is still at work. And so as the people flee, he is still speaking through them. The Spirit is still working in them and using them to spread the gospel. And so right here in this minute, the good news of Jesus Christ is actually traveling out of Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem and fulfilling the command that Jesus gave back in Acts chapter one, verse eight, when Jesus said, and you shall be my witnesses after you receive the power from the Holy Spirit, you shall be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, but then to Judea and Samaria and to the rest of the world. So the persecution is actually what propels the people out of Jerusalem. God is at work in the midst of this very painful time. It reminds me of that beloved Bible verse that we love, uh, Romans uh, 8, 28, for God works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And we know that those all things can be difficult situations and challenging events and pain and heartache and persecution and perhaps even pandemics and perhaps even economic difficulties. God is still at work in his world. And when you and I are willing to surrender to his purposes, he will use the very thing that's causing the problem, that's causing the pain, to bring him glory, to bring him honor, and to spread the gospel. That's something worth holding on to right now, especially in this time where things are, are so upside down. You know, in five years, we can ask ourselves this question, what did I do during COVID-19? What was my reaction? What was my response during this time that was so unsettling? And perhaps we will be able to reflect back and say, I surrendered to God. I surrendered to the Spirit during this time. And the Lord used me during this time to spread his gospel, to bring his good news to the world, to be his hands and feet, to love people in a way perhaps that I have never loved before. You see, it's not about the thing that we are doing as much as it is who we are becoming. And so if something like COVID allows us to have the time to go deeper with God, to pray more, to listen more closely, to spend more time with God, then something beautiful has taken place. And then for some of us, God may be moving us outward and giving us opportunity to be a part of ministry to families uh, in a new way, to a community in a new way. Maybe God is awakening us to new possibilities. God is at work even in the midst of this pandemic. And I believe he is inviting his people, and that's you and me, to participate in all that he is doing while he takes the challenging, difficult, painful things of life and uses them to bring about his glory. And that happens as you and I surrender and offer ourselves to him. Now let's go on and see what continues to happen in the life of Saul. We know that the gospel is spread outward because these Christians have fled Jerusalem. It goes all the way as far as Damascus. And Damascus is about 150 miles away from Jerusalem, which takes about a week for someone to get there walking. So we know that the, the gospel has spread that far because of what Luke records in chapter eight. So if you've got time, you might wanna take a look at chapter eight and see how everything unfolds. But we pick up today with our focal passage in chapter nine, and I'm gonna read a few verses. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, 
so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Saul is still intent on uh, wiping out Christianity, wiping out the followers of the way, wiping out the followers of Jesus, eliminating them. And he goes to Jerusalem and sees the Sadducees um, and asks for permission to be able to continue this persecution. And the, the Sadducees are the court and they approve this. They give him the letters that he needs from the great high priest to give him them the government authority to be able to continue to mount this opposition. And so Saul takes off He's headed all the way to Damascus. He knows that the followers of Christ have spread that far. And the Sadducees send with him their armed guards. So there's guards that are accompanying Paul or Saul as he travels all the way to Damascus. And so as he's moving towards Damascus, you have to wonder what is going through his mind. And many scholars have um, theorized that perhaps Saul is contemplating the Old Testament, meditating on passages, on the prophets, on the, on the teaching that is recorded in the Old Testament. And maybe even he's thinking about the images that are painted of God in the Old Testament. We don't know for sure what he's thinking, but he was a devout Pharisee and he knew the Bible. He knew the Old Testament forwards and backwards. He had the Psalms memorized. He would meditate on scripture as a part of his religious practice. So certainly in some of his time, he is thinking about the prophets, about the prophecies, about what God has said. And as he moves closer to Damascus, he has the encounter with Jesus. So he's not too far outside of Damascus. And let's see what happens. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So in this moment, Saul has fallen to his knees in this encounter, and he sees this bright light, and in this light, he sees the Lord, but he's not sure exactly who this is. And so he asks, and Jesus responds, I am Jesus. I am Jesus of Nazareth. I am the one you are persecuting. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't say, Saul, quit persecuting my followers, but rather he says, you are persecuting me. See, Jesus identifies with the suffering of his people. He identifies with the persecution of those who are following him. And he tells, he tells Saul that he is the one who is being persecuted, even as Saul is attempting to inflict harm on these followers. This bright light, scholars talk about what is this light? And perhaps it is like the light at the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember when Jesus took Peter, James, and John and he went to the top of the mountain to pray and in that beautiful intimacy that he had with God, his glory was revealed and the bright light shone all around him. Well, it sounds similar, doesn't it? The light of Jesus is being revealed. The glory of God is being revealed. And as Paul gazes up into this glory, he sees Jesus and he has nothing to do but to fall down. He has nothing to do but to humble himself and to fall on his face. And in that moment, don't you know that it is going through his mind all that he has done and the sin that he has perpetri perpetrated on these people, the sin that he has committed all that he has done to go against Jesus. Now, when Saul arises, he is going to move into Damascus. He's going to be led by these soldiers. He's blinded, of course. And he's going to be led into Damascus and he's going to go into a house and he's going to be there for three days without food and water. And during this time, I think he is going to reflect on what he has experienced. And somewhere between this initial encounter with Jesus and during these three days, Saul is having a complete change of direction. It began at the moment he encounters Jesus and continues as he considers all that he has known about the Messiah that was to be. It continues as he thinks and reflects on all of his sin and all the things that he has, he has done um, that, that went against God's way. And he opens himself and repents. Now the word repent 
um, means to turn around to go in a different direction. And with Saul, we can see it so clearly. He has been moving in one direction, persecuting Christians uh, to the point of death. He encounters Jesus, and at that moment he encounters Jesus, he turns and goes into a different direction. The word that is translated into repentance, um, I have a professor at Asbury. His name was Dr. Brian Russell, is Dr. Brian Russell, and he gave me a new way of thinking about the word repentance. And he says it can. this word can also be translated to think about alignment or realignment. And, and the nuance here that he is trying to, to um, express in his book, and I, have, I brought a copy of it with me, Realigning with God by Dr. Brian Russell. And in this book, what he says is that Jesus came announcing the kingdom of God and calling men and women to repentance. And what Jesus was telling them um, or inviting them to do was to consider the way they were living, consider the way they were thinking, and to align their lives with the kingdom of God. Jesus had issued in this new way of living, a new way of loving people, a new way of sacrificing oneself for the benefit of others, a new way of worshiping God. And as people responded to this invitation, they would align their lives so that they reflected more of who God intended for them to be. They intended to think like Jesus. They intended to live like Jesus. They intended their conversation to be saturated with, with the love of Christ. And as they aligned themselves with God's way of living, they began to look more and more like Jesus. But Dr. Russell says, and I believe this with all my heart, that this repentance or this realignment is not a one-time occurrence. We don't only do this when we make this decision to follow Jesus. We, of course, we repent in that moment and we turn from our sin. But this alignment goes on on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis, and occasionally, perhaps even on a moment-by-moment -moment basis as we realign our lives with all that God would have for us. So we are constantly um, assessing how we are thinking, how we are speaking, what, how we are behaving, and we are aligning ourselves up with who God is and who God would invite us to be. And of course, that is revealed in Scripture, in the pages of Scripture. So our continuing repentance will lead to continued growth. And that comes as we read God's word and, and the Holy Spirit reveals to us places in our lives where we need to surrender and ask God to help us realign ourselves so that we look and sound and live more like Jesus. Now, this kind of repentance is not something that we do to earn God's favor, and it's not something that we do to earn our salvation. It's rather a response to all that Jesus has done for us. Jesus paid the price for you and me with his death on, on um, the cross. He has purchased our salvation. He has redeemed us, and he has made possible our reconciliation with God. And because of this beautiful free gift of salvation, we receive this, and in response, we offer ourselves back to him. And this response is a surrender of our lives. And we say, I will follow you, Jesus. I will align my life with your purposes. I will continue to realign myself with your purposes as I surrender to you and follow you on an everyday basis. Now, this is what's going on inside of Saul as he sits in this room, as he sits in this room and prays and reflects and mourns his sin. He is becoming a person who is aligning himself with God's new purposes. He is surrendering his old way of doing things, and he is becoming someone who is going to follow Jesus with all that he is, with his heart and his soul. So at the same time, this is happening to Saul. Luke tells us that something else is happening in Damascus. So let's pick up and we will read about a man named Ananias. And this is found in verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, 
For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all those who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias has this conversation with God. God, Jesus comes and reveals in a vision to Ananias that he wants him to leave his own home and to go and seek out Saul, Saul of Tarsus, the one who has come into the city, the one who has come to yank men and women out of their homes and to imprison them because they serve Jesus, the one who has come with papers that allow him to do this. He is, um, he is a, a man of, of, great, of great terror, inflicting great agony and pain and fear into the Christian population. And yet God is sending Ananias to speak to Saul. God has given Ananias a vision that Saul, that he needs to go see Saul at the same time that he has given Saul a vision that a man is going to come and see him. God is working on two fronts at the very same time. And we need to remember this. We need to remember that when God invites us to participate in his work and he invites us to build a relationship with someone or speak a word of encouragement to someone or challenge someone uh, to, to grow deeper in their walk with Christ, when God sends us to be a part of a new ministry, many times what happens to us is we have a sense of um, of we, we don't want to lose control. We are afraid of, of what might happen. We're afraid because we do not know the outcome of these things that we are being asked to do. We do not know how we are going to be received. We don't know how long this mission is going to last. We don't know what is going to be required of us. But here in this moment, this, this passage speaks so clearly that when God is preparing you to use you to do something for his kingdom, to be a part of something in his kingdom, he is also preparing the people who will receive the message that you bring. He is preparing the people that you will minister to. He is preparing the people to hear the word of encouragement that you offer. God is at work in multiple places at the same time. And sometimes we don't know it. Sometimes we can't see. We don't know what has happened. But yet God invites us to, to participate. And perhaps like Ananias, we will be re ready to surrender and do all that God says. Because that's exactly what this brave man does. We see this in verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So right here we see that Ananias is, is using um, his words to communicate something so important to Saul, he calls him brother. Now, just a few verses previous, prior to this, when he's talking to God and, and saying, Lord, I'm not sure I wanna go. Lord, I'm not sure that I wanna go meet um, meet Saul. He, he refers to Saul as this man, but it has changed in, in the time from which he has had this vision and this conversation with Jesus to the point at which he is now engaging with Saul. He is ready to call Saul my brother. What a beautiful phrase. And don't you know Saul sitting there in his repentance, in his grief, in his sorrow for his sin, in the agony of knowing all he did that was wrong. That's, this must have been music, beautiful music to Saul's ears because it's a word, a beautiful word of forgiveness and restoration. So Ananias offers this to Saul and says, my brother, I have been sent to you. And then Ananias, in the next verse, we see, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. 
Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. So Ananias comes in and speaks to Saul. He lays his, uh, his hands on Saul. Saul receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, and his, his vision is healed. And something like scales fall from his eyes, and he arises, he is baptized, and he takes food and is strengthened. And now we know that this man who had been someone who was so uh, so terrible, someone that everyone feared, um, has now turned to become the greatest missionary that the world will ever see. We now see that Saul is going to now become the Apostle Paul, who will move out on the mission to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentile nations. And he will write most of the New Testament. Saul, is, this Apostle Paul, is going to leave such a mark uh, on the life of the people in the book of Acts, on this early church, but also on you and me. But you know, when we think about him, we need to remember quiet, humble Ananias, the man that stood in the background, the man that trembled a little bit when God called him to go, but who was willing and who surrendered and who was obedient. You see, the world is made up of both. The world is made up, the Christian church is made up of Ananiases and people who are commissioned to take the gospel in a bold way. It takes all of us working with the gifts that we have been given, with a call that has been made on our life to move the gospel forward. God is at work through Ananias. God is at work in and through the um, Saul of Tarsus. God is at work in and through you and I. And sometimes in the middle of things that seem to be the most unlikely, it seemed to be the most difficult and challenging, sometimes in the middle of pandemics and economic crises and, and uh, the times when the world feels so unsettled and, and out of control, God is at work and he's calling you and me, whether we look more like an Ananias or more like the Apostle Paul, he is calling us to take our story and to come and connect it with his great redemptive mission and to allow him to work through us, through our stories, through our experiences, through the people that we uh, know, the places that we go, and through us to change the world. And that's the invitation. That's the invitation to look at the life of Saul and from that to recognize the need to repent to realign with God's purposes, and then to take a closer look at the life of Ananias and recognize that in this quiet, humble man, there's the opportunity to also to, to pattern our lives in, in this way as well and to hear God speak, and then to look at the courageous apostle who moves out with the message to the Gentiles and to see that God is in all of this and that God wants to use all of us. So I don't know how the Lord might be speaking to you this morning, but I, I believe there's an invitation here for us all. Will we realign our lives with the invitation of the Holy Spirit? Will we look at the season where we are, the middle of a pandemic, and recognize that God is at work? How might God be inviting you to participate in all that he is doing right now in this moment in history? Will you pray with me, please? Gracious Father, we're so grateful for your love and your grace, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who meets us, Lord, in our sin and offers us forgiveness, who has sacrificed his life on our behalf, Lord, and because of him, we are reconciled to you. Lord, because of him, we can enter into this new life that is abundant and eternal. And God, you invite us to realign ourselves, to follow you, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus to begin to think and to speak and to live as our Savior. So God, we come this morning and we say, we recognize that there are so many things that, um, that we do wrong. There are so many thoughts that we think that are not Christ-like. There's so many words and phrases that we say that do not speak of the things of God. So we confess this to you and we ask you, Lord, that your spirit will work in us and that you will help us realign our lives so that we look more like Jesus. And Lord, in this time that's upside down, in this world that seems to have gone so crazy in this moment, we surrender ourselves 
And we declare that you are working even in our midst. And God, we ask you to use us. We can't see how and we don't know when, but Lord, we know that you are working. And so we give you ourselves. We, we surrender our lives. Use us. Help us to be um, your people with your mission moving forward, led by your spirit in the world. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. I hope you have a great week.